It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. What is my name? What is my summer's name? It's Torah Talk. We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. How you doing? Good, man. How are you? Well, I'm fine. I've been resting all day. Yes. Yeah. They were great. Those photos you sent through of you as a little nipper with your guitar. Yeah. And your guitar and well, I, I was. Uh, Bob and I were the same height. Uh, basically, we still are. But uh, yeah, Mark and Paula were pretty short. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Let me turn this up a little bit so I can hear you better. Yeah. I think I, I think I can hear you better now. Let's see. I was turning the uh, treble control. So why don't you say something? And I'll. Once I say something, <laughs> is that better? Oh, then I can hear you now. Fine. <laughs> Normally, I don't listen to it with these speakers on because it annoys the wife. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. I love music and. Uh, well, you know, I like to hear things, and uh, she it annoys her. It just sounds like noise to her. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Did you say she had a, a hearing thing? Well, uh, yes, she has to hear what she wants to hear a little bit louder than I do. I've got very sensitive ears. Yeah. Uh, being around all those drums didn't really affect me. <laughs> then I went in the Air Force, and I was around all those jet engines. Yeah. Yeah, we wore ear protection. We had double ear protection, really. Yeah. We had these ear plugs, and then over that, we put these huge mufflers. Because I worked on the flight line, mm. and it was very noisy. Yeah. But you could hear it right through your head. You know, it was deafening. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so been? Uh, I've been fine. Yeah. You know, uh, working hard though. You know, mm. doing. I'm, I'm preparing uh, the next seminar, which is going to make a lot of people, uns well, I don't know, maybe not a lot of people, but some of the people that are more racist and inclined to, uh, their uh, people are very biased about that. Uh, there's some level of bigotry in everyone, you know. Mm. And uh, it's going to be on that topic, but it's a stronghold. Mm. So we want to we want to tear down the strongholds, you know. Yeah. And uh, get it in the perspective of Yahusha. So everything's uh, according to his perspective. Our minds are supposed to be uh, according to his thoughts, not ours. You know, hmm. How does he view the various races? Yeah. 
I had a disturbing email come from a, a sister that was very inclined to convince me that until I came to the realization that I have to hear the message from her race, that she's not going to really have anything to do with me, nor call me brother, mm. you know. Wow. But you know, that's, uh, I don't know, they don't have scripture, but I'm going to try to show them uh, a little bit about what scripture says on the subject, you know. Mm. But uh, today you want to talk about the two witnesses, I understand, and that's yes. it's a wonderful topic. That's a good one. Mm. Because it's a it's an eschaton you know item. Hmm. Two witnesses or something that happened just before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is uh, well we, let's see we've got seals seven seals and then we've got seven trumpets and then we have seven bowls and some of these things are going to be warnings and other ones are going to be judgments you know hmm. and uh, it's because of Yahuwah wanting to purge the evil from our midst hmm. and uh, you know we, we're gonna we're gonna see some scripture on that that's hmm. a great that's a great subject so if the seventh seal the first seal sorry when the first seals open like the the big heavenly throne room scene in Revelation where they're standing around and you know who can on sort of weeping and no one everyone's crying and no one can open the seal and then the lamb arrives freshly slain if he's freshly slain and then he opens a seal, that would imply that that whole scene of the first seal happened as soon as he was slain, like when he went and offered his blood. Does that align with your thinking? Well, it, it, you know, we don't want to set it in concrete, but we yeah. can look at it that way. But if we start making charts, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Then uh, yeah. we can, of course, understand endless charts. And yeah. one person can make a chart, another person can come with another chart, and another chart. And there's no end to the charts that can be made. Hmm. But this is all, like I said before, it's outside our sovereignty. It's not our, uh, you know, we're not supposed to know. But it does make sense. Hmm. You know, just because it makes sense doesn't make it so. But I agree with wh everything you just said. Mm. Yes, he is slain, and uh, that's when it happened. And it does seem to have an order to it, but the order is also set down as a, a path of legality and prophecy. So, you know, these are things that we'll look back upon, just like we're looking back now upon all the things that went before. Mm. They were prophesied as well, mm. and yet now we're looking back at them. And mm. the, for Abraham to say, what's this star, what's these... What's this, this, what's all these things that I'm hearing about? Well, you see, for him to sit down and start making charts uh, <laughs> and his expectations and then setting other people up for yeah. maybe a little bit of a, you know, see, expectations are where we get ourselves all jumbled up. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is truth to some of these things. Like mm -hmm. uh, one of the statements made by, uh, who was it? Monty Judah in one of his uh, exposés, he said that uh, the three and a half years that remain ahead of us, that where there's going to be a beginning point where the judgments begin again, and the final return of Yahusha happens to be right at three and a half years. You know, Well, it would make sense that his return, his actual day, the day he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, it's going to be during the seventh moon then it makes logical sense that the beginning of that pattern would occur sometime at or just before Passover one year. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we talked about this last, last time we were together, mm -hmm. about when the beginning of the three and a half years might be. Well, we don't know, but it would make sense that it would follow along the lines of what Mati Judah pointed out. And that is that it would begin sometime in late winter or right around Passover that the, that the beginning would happen. And it would also correlate to Passover because there was a mighty arm, you know, by a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Uh, his people were brought out and protected. Mm. And when they are brought out this next time, we will be in another kind of deliverance, an exodus, a second exodus where we'll be under his protection again in a bigger way all over the entire earth. But the uh, Shekinah 
or the appearance of him as lightning from the east even to the west would be at his return when, you know, the in the seventh month, you know, which would be three and a half years later. At least that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But let's not set that in concrete either. But we don't know exactly what day or what hour or what year it's going to be. But we do know the season, mm -hmm. you know. Well, without setting anything in concrete, the thing that amazed us about that whole throne room scene was that um, most of us are looking for the future for all these things to start. I mean, Christianity is waiting for the lawless one to come and change all the times and seasons, and they're thinking this is all a future event when we've understood that, well, Constantine's already done all that. They're living it. Yeah, they're yeah. living in the church. Yeah. So the thro if the throne room scene was way back then as well, that means that the, the seals, the... The, the bowls and the you know possibly some some of more stuff has been opening up while we've been watching it and people are going to be shocked because they're waiting for something to happen that's already begun look at what's going on in the earth yeah and then you have to look at it too when you're appealing to a Christian mindset that why would Yahusha take his own people and reject them and their way of living according to his commandments and then uh, because they disobeyed him and then accept another people that were disobedient and that believed they didn't have to obey. Uh, why would he do that? Well, it's because these people that are Christianity are actually his people also. Because there are people that are not his people and yet they are his people because he sowed them into the nations. Amos 9 verse 9 tells us that. And the, the, the whole parable of the prodigal son is about these people being sent out into a distant land and then realizing who they are and returning to the father's household, which is his covenant. So, yeah, it all makes sense. So if if you put Christianity under the, under the heading of the, the son that was sown into the nations... Um, could that put everybody in the earth under the same banner? Every religion under the same banner? Well, the religions are the uh, things that are not going to be a, existing when he returns. Because part of the system of men, which is reflected in that statue that was given in the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, that Daniel interpreted through the help of Yahusha, or Yahuwah being, opening his mind to it, uh, that's part of all these religions and patterns and governments and kingdoms are all going to just disappear. Mm -hmm. Babylon is, uh, would include the, uh, all the symbols of government and religion that we have had that, well, Hashatan and mankind embrace today. But his, his ways are going to be as the, what is it, the waters that cover the earth? You know, and his law, his Torah, is going to go forth from Jerusalem, and he's going to reestablish it. It won't be a different law, though. It'll be the same one, written on the hearts and minds of men and women. Amazing. Yes. And, we, we, and we, you see, he's already given us a little inkling of his spirit so that we see it, and we understand that we want to obey. See, the, the, but that's what Christianity... That's why Christianity can say things like the Torah is, what was it that that gentleman said? He said that it's our, our, a curse, <laughs> but or whatever, and, and then they think that no one can obey it. Well, they can't without his help. See, his spirit enables it. And that's what broke away in the, in the garden was, you see, there was a separation. Yahuwah left the man and the woman, and they were naked and and saw their nakedness and and this uh presence of yahuwah was was something that was around them all the time but then when they sinned they broke fellowship with him and that's when he's already begun to restore in us his not serene so that we have a a view of his mind now and we understand his his covenant and and that is teaching us how to love that's the thing that the covenant does. It teaches us love. And that's its objective. That's the goal. And when we miss it with all the minutia, we uh, have lost the, the heart of the man. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. This is a slight off subject point, but it reminded me when we were in the, about the garden. The, 
We read a book about the Messiah that Todd uh, Bennett wrote last year, and he was when he was explaining the garden, he he implied something, but he never really went into it. That when the snake and the woman and the man were having this exchange, that something very sinister went on. That something he he didn't he kind of implied sexual, but then he didn't go into it. And he just implied that something really devious and mischievous went on. And that's why there was such a big deal about the nakedness and this and that, everything, when they came to. Um, have you heard those sort of theories before? Yes, I have. And it's uh, reading things into the text mm. from our fleshly mindset now. Mm. And that is embraced by many people. They really do believe that the sex, that there was a sexual sin of some sort, or that sex itself, mm -hmm. having sex, was what this all represented. Mm -hmm. But it isn't that. It's not a metaphor or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That that's what we like to do with ourselves is uh, <laughs> yeah. play these little games. But I don't project that onto the situation at all, personally, mm -hmm. because I see it as reading something into the text. And you see, that's how we make our mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, like we have those two processes of reading scripture, we can read what scripture is teaching us, or we can bring what we already believe to the scriptures and read it in. Mm. You know, and that's where we make our mistakes about races or uh, people doing things. You know, yeah. But, well, we won't leave people on the edge of their seat. They're all dying to know what you think. Who you think the two witnesses are? Is it? Is it Hukunon? Is it is uh, it uh, Moshe? Is it Eliyahu? Is it Enoch? Let's go yeah. there. <laughs> well, you know, it could be uh, any of those people. However, I do lean in an area, and Enoch and Eliyahu or Elijah are two very prominently believed to be witnesses. However, well, they're all witnesses because his people all through time have been his witnesses. Now, the witnesses are on different levels, but, you know, if we begin with the idea of witnesses and what Yahuwah himself called to be witnesses before his nation existed, and that was the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth were themselves called as witnesses, which kind of is a pre or a precedent that he set. And, of course, any precedent he sets would have to have some impact on it. But the first mention, though, of two witnesses have to do with a legal judgment that involves the death penalty. Because you see, the death penalty, which, where a crime has been committed that is so heinous that the perpetrator has to be executed, the only way that that can be done or carried out is with the mouth of two or more witnesses two or three witnesses are required, so at least two. And uh, the first mention of the two witnesses uh, in that regard, the legality of them, is the foundation laid at Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7. Let me read that to you. Uh, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death. He is not put to death by the mouth of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and the hand of all the people last. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Now the witnesses are the first to engage in purging the evil from the midst. Then all the people engage in that same activity. But the objective is to purge the evil from our midst. Now this is a reflection of what's going to happen in the future during the time of the two witnesses themselves. Because they're going to be purging the evil from the midst of the entire earth and they're going to be joined in by the rest of us, but they'll be the first. And that's an interesting thing because in the, in the very first mention of this legal pronouncement this is a reflection that's carried on all the way through Scripture and all the way to the very end. And it's very interesting that that's the case. We're going to see that happen, too. There was a, let's see, a place where purging the evil from the midst concerning Yahushua's process that he gave us about people that sinned against us. 
like in the case of Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 16, it says, But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. So you see, even Yahusha is referring back to his own legal foundation for that. And if he refuses to hear them, say it to the assembly. And if he refuses even to hear the assembly, let him be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, uh, someone that you cannot fellowship with. Now, um, the seven seals, and then the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowls are all going on sometime through time. And like you were mentioning, possibly the first seal started right when, I guess, Jeru Jerusalem was destroyed. It would make sense. Because, you know, there was a 40-year gap between his death and the destruction of the temple, you know, the second temple. Mm -hmm. And that's a, sort of a period of judgment, you know. So judgment f started to fall 40 years after that. And a lot of people understand that 40 is a, is a sort of a, a number that is held in high regard mm -hmm. in the realm of judgment. I was thinking it was more like when he said to, was it um, Miriam, don't touch me, I haven't been, I haven't, yeah. I haven't offered myself yet, or uh, I was thinking it was right then before he came back. You reckon it's 40 years later? No, well, no charts not, <laughs> Well, yeah, let's not get the charts out, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we do have a fulfillment of prophecy on that particular thing you're citing, where she was about to touch him, and he saw that, it was going to happen, but that particular day was first fruits, and he, being the resurrected, the resurrected first fruits, had to wave himself before Yahuwah, and he didn't want to have that have been defiled by touching something that was not, uh, you know, clean. And you see, a woman was not to be uh, touching a rabbi anyway, but you know, or he's the only rabbi. But you know, the fact is, he's the high priest, and the high priest cannot be defiled in any way. And he had, and he was operating as our high priest then, as went, you know, that particular day, fulfilling a prophecy called First Fruits, or Bikurim, 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 yeah. And the uh, interesting thing about that is that the, when he was standing there telling her not to touch him, that he had yet to, to fulfill that, go to his father, he had to ascend to his father first. But later that same day, he was able to be touched and was inviting people to touch him. Mm. See, that same day. Mm. But anyway, back to the seventh, uh, I mean, to the uh, the idea that that might have been a, uh, a seal opening. Uh, that's unlikely because the seals are not, you know, the fulfillment of uh, our redemptive plan. It's more the opening of the uh, judgment, judgment of earth. Yeah. And the things that people are going to have to endure because they will not repent. And he's slowly been unfolding these things over time. Mm -hmm. So I agree more like with what you said. But then the seven trumpets occur mm -hmm. as the beginning of the seventh seal. Mm -hmm. So the seventh seal opens up the seven trumpets. Mm -hmm. And then the seventh trumpet is going to open up the seven bowls, which are going to be even more ferocious than all. Mm. But uh, before, it's a, it's sorry, yeah, go ahead. it's a, the whole thing's a dream anyway. It's a vision. How can people put a time limit on a, a vision? Like everybody knows, when you have a dream, they just flow into each other, and they, you know, yep. some, and that's what we were talking about when we read through it. This could be here. And then we could go somewhere else, and then we pick up later on in the same dream, in the same sequence, and it's. All yeah. vital, it's all vital information, but like you're saying, the timeline is, you know. Yeah, that, sometimes a chapter will proceed, and then the next chapter, or two chapters later, it could proceed backing up to explain more details that were in the other one. That, but uh, prior to the seventh messenger sounding his trumpet, prior to the opening of the seven bowls is what it really means, uh, there's something interesting that happens. And that is recorded in Revelation 10, verse 11. And he said to me, 
you have to prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and sovereigns. So he's talking about many people that Yehuchanan or John, the, the writer of the revelation of Yahushua, is going to have to prophesy again. But this is prior to the sounding of the seventh messenger which is well along in the progress of the seals, trumpets, and bowls, because the seven bowls begin with the seventh trumpet. And, uh, you know, it's... And then what follows there um, kind of reflects the things that are going to happen in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 mentioned what sounds like the two witnesses, and he identifies them. And if there's any... I'm going to tell you why I, I uh, gravitate towards two individuals. One, and, and I don't think that they're the actual individuals. I think they're actually the spirit of those individuals in the idea of what their accomplishments are for, what they're about. See, Moshe had a function, and Elijah, or Eliyahu, had a function. And Moshe had to do with the, the Torah, and... Eliyahu had to do with the name, because he said, choose today which one you will serve, either B-A-A-L, the Lord, or Yahuwah. Now that's Eliyahu. So these two people are the spirit of these two, are the function of these two people, seem to gravitate heavily in Malachi 4, because look at this. Malachi 4, 1 through 6 says, for look, the day shall come burning like a furnace, and all the proud and every wrongdoer shall be stumbled. And the day that shall come shall burn them up, said Yahuwah of hosts, which leaves to them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Now that has a reference to the seat seat, you know, the seat seat that we wear, in his wings. And you shall go out and leap for joy like calves from the stall. And you shall trample the wrongdoers, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, said Yehu of hosts. Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, the Torah, which I commanded him at Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. Notice that word, right rulings. See, I am sending you Eliyah, or Eliyahu, the prophet. See, he mentioned Moshe and Eliyahu, the prophet, before, I'm sending you, Eliyahu the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah, the day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. So there's two men. These are two real men, too, that are going to appear, but they're going to have the spirit of Moshe, or the function of Moshe and the function of Eliyahu. And they're going to both possess that. One is going to be reflecting uh, the uh, aspects of Moshe, teaching Torah, and the other one's going to be pronouncing the name. Because Revelation 11, where they're mentioned, the two witnesses that are mentioned in the future, happen to be two real men. And they're in the spirit or function of Moshe and Eliyahu. It says in, Roman, in Revelation 11, starting in verse 3, And I shall give unto my two witnesses. Now that means he's going to give them power and protection. It's almost like his Shekinah is going to blast forth from the heavens, and it's going to envelop them and protect them for a period of time while they prophesy. And they shall prophesy 1,000 260 days clad in sackcloth. So they're going to be in uh, the, the clothing of mourn, mourners, you know, people that are, that are mourning because of the great activity that they're going to involve in. They're, they're going to be carrying out the early part of the death penalty because the two witnesses, as we read before, are the beginning of the death and the mayhem that's going to unfold. Because you see, the two witnesses are the first to take the life of the, of the accused. And there's going to be a lot of people accused. Now, it says, these are the two olive trees and the two menorah, or menorah, lampstands, 
that are standing before the Elohim of the earth. Now, if you see how that reflects back to Zechariah chapter 4, if you read Zechariah chapter 4, there's that whole chapter is all about this same thing in Revelation 11. It talks about these two people. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire. Now, that's uh, emblematic of the Shekinah. Okay? It's like the thing that, that cooked the guy that reached out and tried to stop the ark from falling. <laughs> you know, when the man that was on the car, they weren't carrying the ark properly. And Yahuwah was dealing with that, but then when he reached out and touched it, he wasn't supposed to touch it. Then he was fried. And what they saw was f what they described as fire. But it's much more intense than fire. It's mm -hmm. Shekinah. It's the Shekinah Kabat, or the glow, the, what they call the glow. Now, and it says, if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out from their mouth and consumes their enemies. And if anyone wishes to harm them, he has to be killed in that way. Now, that's like, if you read, what is it, Psalm 34, or is it 35? Uh, it talks about laying a net for someone, and they are to be caught in their own net, you know. So he, he who wishes to harm them has to be killed in that way. Revelation 11.6 continues, These possess the authority, now watch the correlation between Moshe and Eliyahu. These possess the authority to shut the heavens so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Now that happened during the days of Eliyahu. Remember the drought? It was three, uh, three and a half years. Huh, how about that? Mm -hmm. And they possess authority over the waters to turn them to blood. Now, this is Revelation we're reading. Now, that's what Moshe did. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. Well, that sounds like Moshe, too. You know, these two seem to be the, uh, you know, reflecting the, the power and authority given to these two men, Eliyahu and Moshe, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it continues in, in verse 7 of chapter 11 of Revelation. And when they have ended their witness, the beast comes up out of the pit of the deep, shall fight against them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Saddam and Mitzrayim, where also our master was impaled. And some of the people, and peoples and tribes and tongues and nations, see their dead bodies for three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be placed into tombs. And those dwelling on the earth rejoice over them and exult, and they shall send gifts to each other, because these two prophets tortured those dwelling on the earth. Mm. And after the three and a half days, a spirit of life from Elohim entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from the heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into the heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Wow. When it uh, talks about the, the beast coming out of the pit, is that referring to like the fourth beast, like the system, papal system coming against them? Or is that referring to like a Satan-filled, you know, shell of a... Mm in a man or a nepho or something like that? Well, you know, it, uh, without getting down to painting yeah. picture of it, but we, we have a, an inkling of the idea that the fourth beast is a repository or uh, an accumulation of the first, second, third, and fourth beast. So it's all of those things in a composite form. And it's Babel is what it is. And it's, in, it's in residence in the world system, which includes, of course, religious systems. And, of course, we know that the Jesuit Illuminati is behind the United Nations and gun control laws, the banking system, the he World Health Organization. Everything that comes under the umbrella of the world, uh, well, the United Nations, you know, it's all there. And... And, and it, we know that they're going to, the armies of the world, which would be described probably today as the United Nations, would be surrounding Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is going to be like a fire pot among sheaves, which is trying to explain, I think, 
that it's going to use nuclear power to defend itself. Because, see, they have a plan in place that if they see themselves as not coming out of the, an attack, they, they're going to use the Samson strategy. Mm. The whole temple all around them is going to fall, which means, <laughs> and then the United Nations is going to step in. But uh, it could be that the United Nations is going to be included. <laughs> mm. But it, it does say that all the nations all around are going to become like a fire pot among sheaves. So it's just going to be exploding like you wouldn't believe. Hmm. And that trip point can happen any time. Not a good time to be moving to Jerusalem, is it? You think? <laughs> why, did he say, why did he say, when you see the city surrounded by armies, then flee yeah. into the nations, hmm. flee to the mountains, which are the nations? Well, he didn't say, and then when it calms down, go back. You know, he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to scatter you to the four winds, and we've assimilated. I mean, you know, and now we're awakening to ourselves. That's what the prodigal son does. He's been, he's in a pig pen because he's, he's not only working with unclean people and unclean false uh, belief systems and patterns of, of worship, but uh, all these abominable things are uh, welling up in his heart, and he's and, he, and he's remembering. Wait a minute, there's there's something that I've forgotten, and it hits a, it's his identity. Mm -hmm. And now we know who we are, and that's why we're so excited. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. So how does Yehukanon come into the into the the power or the the roles that are represented with um, Moshe and Eliyahu? Do you think he'll play a role in that too? Or? Well, there's uh, some that seem to believe that he's going to be around mm -hmm. because it, it, you know there's a place in in the in the book of John right at the end that he describes a situation where the rumor went out that he's not going to die. And I think did I did I record that at all? In this, yeah, we did. Um, from Patmos with love, we went through all those texts. Yeah, well, we could look at it real quick again because mm -hmm. there's something very important about this, and that's you know the identity of John himself. Of course, he would tell you right up front that he's not important, but he is because he was the disciple whom Yahusha loved. The, in the book of John, we don't have any writer called John. That's not happening. The identity of the writer, uh, we just have called it that. But his, of course, the Hebrew term would be Yahukana. But the, the writer is only referred to by the title or the terminology, the disciple whom Yahusha loved. And that's uh, how he describes himself. But that's also an interesting thing because the the, the brother of, of Miriam and Martha was named, as the world knows him, Lazarus, which is actually Eleazar in Hebrew. And the real uh, fact is, he was the one that was called, only in this book, the disciple whom Yahushua loved. So the writer of this book is really that man, the disciple whom Yahushua loved, that he resurrected out of, he called him forth out of the tomb. And a lot of people don't mention that. I don't know why. But anyway, at the very end, in chapter 21 of the book of John, it's really the book of Lazarus, isn't it? Or Eleazar. After this, Yahushua manifested himself again to the top ones at the Sea of Kenareth, and he manifested this way. Shimon, Kepha, and Toma, called the twin, and Nathani, Nathaniel of Cana in Galil, the sons of Zabdi, and two others of his taught ones were together. And Shimon Kepha said to them, I'm going to go fish. And, he, and, and they said to him, we're coming also with you. And they went out and immediately entered into the boat. And that night they caught nothing at all. But when it came early morning, the resurrected Yahushua stood on the beach, however, 
the taught ones, did not know that it was Yahusha. Then Yahusha said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Throw the net on the right side of the boat, and you shall find. So they threw, and they were no longer able to draw it in because of the large number of fish. The taught one, whom Yahushua loved, then said to Kepha, It's the master. <laughs> then Shimon Kepha, hearing that it was the master, put on his outer garment, for he was stripped, and plunged into the sea. And the other taught ones came in the little boat, for they were not far from land but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. So when they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Yahushua said to them, Bring some of the fish which you've now caught. Shimon Kepha went up and dragged the net to the land, filled with 153 big fishes. And though there were so many, the net was not broken. Yahushua said to them, Come, have breakfast. And not one of the taught ones had the courage to ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the master. Yahushua came and took the bread, gave it to them, and the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Yahushua was manifested to his taught ones after he was raised from the dead. When therefore they had eaten breakfast, Yahushua said to Shimon Kepha, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yea, master, you know I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again, the second time, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, master, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Shimon, son of Yonah, do you love me? Kepha was sad because he had said it to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Master, you know all, you know that I love you. Yahushua said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you shall stretch out your hands, and another shall gird you and bring you where you do not wish. Now this he said, signifying by what death he would esteem elegant. And having said this, he said to him, follow me. And Kepha, turning around, saw the taught one whom Yahushua loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Master, who is the one who is delivering you up? Seeing him, Kepha said to Yahushua, but Master, what about this one? And Yahushua said to him, if I wish him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment and say, remember that the person that they're referring to is Eleazar, the one that Yahushua had already raised from the dead. <laughs> he's wondering if he's going to die again. Now, Yahushua said to him, if I wish him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Therefore, this word went out among the brothers that this taught one would not die. However, Yahushua did not say to him he would not die, but if it is his desire, but if I desire him to remain until I come, what is it to you? This is the taught one who bears witness about these matters and who wrote these matters, and we know that his witness is true. Now, there is much else that Yahushua did. If every one of them were written down, I think that the world itself would not contain the written books. Amen. He did a lot of things in front of them that are not written down. So many things that it would boggle our minds. That's why they had such an incredible belief. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think he's still alive based on what that says. If all of this is true, I mean, you know, why wouldn't it be true? He can do anything he wants. Yeah. So yeah, I think he's, he's still around. Now, I think he's going to be one of the two witnesses, really. Which one, I don't know, but, you know, he's the one, the disciple whom Yahushua loved, and his memoir or gospel is proving more than all the others 
it, it kind of stands apart as revealing who Yahushua is for uh, his identity being the, the son of, of, of Yahuwah. And uh, I don't know, it's just uh, an amazing witness. And, you know, it would be nice to have an eyewitness that was here in the last days that would give corroboration and uh, establish the authenticity because I wouldn't, we, I mean, everything's possible with Yahushua. So I think it's really good that he referred to him as a witness. And then in the book of Revelation, he said he's going to have to witness again. Mm. You know, so that's a reflection too. So it's the same person. The writer of Revelation and the writer of the fourth, fourth gospel are the same man. And his name is Elazar. Mm. But he took the name Yahukadon probably because they were trying to kill him. Because, see, the Pharisees were trying to kill him, as it says in the record, because his resurrection from the tomb, Miriam, Miriam and Martha's brother, was so profound, and it had caused so many people to follow Yahushua, that they sought to kill him too. So they were not just trying to kill Yahushua, but they were also trying to kill Elazar. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, if we read Zechariah 4, and I referred to that before too, it talks about the two witnesses as being the two olive trees. And it says one is at the right of the menorah and the other is at its left. And in Zechariah 4, starting in verse 11, it's, uh, it carries on and says, And I responded a second time and said to him, What are these two olive branches with empty golden oil? from themselves, that empty golden oil from themselves by means of the two gold pipes. Well, and he answered and said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my master. And he said, these are the two menorot, literally two lamp oil sons, who stand beside the master of the earth. You know, and that's what Revelation described them as. You know, we read that. If you look at Matthew 17, verses 3 and 4, and Revelation 11, verses 3 through 10. Anyway, notice the last sentence in the above verse was written about 520 BCE, and it's found again in Revelation 11, describing the two witnesses. And I shall give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days, clad in sackcloth. That's grieving and, and mourning clothes or humility. Uh, and that's three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. See, it reflects perfectly from Zechariah chapter 4. That are standing before the Elohim of the earth. So the uh, idea of the lampstand is that the, the light of the world is manifested by the lamp oil that comes forth from the lamp. You know, like the wise virgins have the oil, which is the energy, which is the spiritual energy of Yahushua's presence. And we've stored away the Torah in our hearts, which is our lamp. And Yahushua said in, Ma in Matthew chapter 5, at verse 14, you are the light of the world. You know, if we're carrying the oil in our lamps, which is the Torah, and we're teaching it, it's possible that we ourselves could be participating with the two witnesses, you know, the two houses of Israel. One doesn't care, convey the name, but they do convey the Torah, the house of Yehuda. Those are what the world calls the Jews. And then we, being the Nazarene, are carrying both, but we agree with the Torah because it's written on our hearts. So it would embody both the name and the word. So the name and the word are the two witnesses, you know. The two things that he's lifted higher than all things. His word and his name above all else. And it says in, uh, what is it, uh, Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 8.20? To the Torah and to the witness. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light of dawn. You know. So the two witnesses are going to really be important. And I think that it could be the, the houses of Israel, too, because the house of Israel, are, it was divided in the north and south. You had the ten tribes, 
that seceded away as a tax revolt initially, and they were at war with the South, and they even set up a false temple up there. And that's, that's where Elijah, or Eliyahu, was, you know, sent, the Tishbite, the prophet. But there's another thing that happens, too, before the sounding of the seventh messenger, the seventh trumpet, just before the bowls begin. It says, Revelation 10, 7, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh messenger, when he is about to sound, the secret of Elohim shall also be ended as he declared to his servants the prophets. Now that's interesting because, you know, in, the, in a couple of verses later, in verse 11 it says, And he said to me, You have to prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and sovereigns. And this disciple that, that wrote this in Revelation, the world calls him John, and that he would have to prophesy again. Now that's interesting concerning many. And yet, maybe he hasn't died yet. Because, you know, he did die once, and then he was called forth. And he said, Elazar, come forth. And he did. And who can resist? You know, the spoken, the creative word. You know, but uh, not only has he been kept secret, what secret would Elohim be keeping? That there's some fellow walking around that's about a 2,000 years old. <laughs> but the message is more important still. And that message is concerning the scattered northern ten tribes of Israel. You know? Hmm. What about that? That's definitely a secret, isn't it? Yeah, it seems to be. Uh -huh. everybody, uh, everybody puts some kind of ancient uh, connection with the, the Jews of today. They've got their Torah and they've got their wacky little hats and things, and everybody thinks they're a bit archaic and ancient, but so people wouldn't be surprised to hear that they're tied to the scripture somehow, because it's what they, they're on about, but for the other ten tribes to suddenly, for there to be more tribes, that that's a big, oh yeah, that's a secret, definitely. Thank you for bringing that point out, because the awakening of those tribes in the last days among the nations who returned to the Torah has been kept a secret, and it's been kept a secret from the dragon, because it's you know he's been looking for, the you know persecuting the woman, you know being Israel, uh, as as well as they can be found, and now it seems that the entire world is actually the seed. The secret is now ending, so the seventh messenger is about to sound, and the, and that means the bowls are going to start. And that's real close to the end because it's going to be rapid fire. It's not going to be like, oh, we've got another 500 years. No, the bowls are going to be unbelievably ferocious. And the witnesses are also the declarations themselves, the Ten Commandments, because the housing of the two stone tablets was called the house of the, you know, the house, where they housed them, was called the tent of the witness. So we've got the, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the, the two tables of stone. And the tent around it is called the tent of the witness. So what's the valuable thing that's in there? Mm. Other than the Shekinah, of course. But we've got that as the throne of Yahuwah, the name of Yahuwah in residence, the, the nesting of the name above the cherubim on the, on the mercy seat. But then inside the box, Yahuwah's presence is there because his covenant was in that box. It wasn't the box. It was the thing that was in the box that made it, that made the box special. And that covenant has been, you know, it's been uh, castigated and, 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 and hated and thought of as nothing, trampled on. His word has been trampled in the streets, you know, under the idea of people ignoring it. Like it didn't matter. Uh, <laughs> and he put it in a special gold box and he brought his presence down above it, and they say, oh, well, that doesn't matter anymore. What? Well, <laughs> in the book of Revelation, Yehuka looks up and sees the Ark of the Covenant. And it isn't the Ark that is so special, it's the Covenant. Whatever. Anyway, the tablets were identical to each other, written on both sides. One was the husband's, 
and the other one was the wife's. And they were small enough that Moshe could carry them in one hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were these massive things that he had to break his back carrying down the mountain. Huh? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> they were a testament Pocket to the marriage. Size. Yeah, it was a. They were they were the physical doc, document of the marriage between Yehuda and Israel. And the tribes of Israel, when you say Israel, you have to remember there's more than just the Jews or the Yahudim. One tablet was the husband's and the other one belonged to the wife. And it was the marriage ketubah, as they call it in Hebrew. And these are two witnesses which bear the record of the marriage. So one day they'll be brought forth as evidence. And it's interesting that the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned as appearing in the heavens inside the temple of Elohim in Revelation chapter 11 also. See, in the, the two witnesses are mentioned only in chapter 11 of Revelation. And that's the same place that the covenant is mentioned as appearing in the heavens inside the temple. In the same chapter. And it says in verse 19 of chapter 11, And the dwelling place, now the dwelling place is the nesting place, or the Shekinah. That's the presence of Elohim. His name. The dwelling place of Elohim was opened in the heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his dwelling place. Wow. He's keeping that covenant very close. And there came to be lightnings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and great hail. And now we understand that the dwelling place, which we call the temple, coming from the heavens is in fact his own bride. Because he's he's going to keep her close too. He's going to he's building his bride, you know, and that's what we're appealing to. So she's going to be reunited, be reunited to Yahusha, who are her redeemer. And the everlasting covenant will be seen within our dwelling place. We're going to be close to it too, you know. But most importantly, him. The the unredeemed will see the dead raised. And then they'll behold the assembling of the immortal Israel into the dwelling place. Revelation 11 says, And after the three and a half days, a spirit of life from Elohim entered into them. Those are the two witnesses. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw, him, saw them. And they heard a loud voice from the heavens saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into the heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And that's clearly the re resurrection of the dead, mm. of those who lived in the covenant, and it will be followed by the redemption of those still alive. And we will at once acknowledge that Yahushua is our sovereign, taking reign of the earth. That's going to be the day he takes control. Now, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Therefore, three and a half days can be also looked upon as... 3,500 years, because that's, if a day is a 1,000 years, and, it, and three and a half days, it would have to be 3,500 years. Now, that's one other way of looking at things, but the covenant, which is the marriage, occurred on Mount Sinai, and promises were exchanged. Now, the marriage feast is still ahead, and it should be about 3,500 years after the two witnesses were slain by the beast system. So the truth fell in the streets, as it is said. In Yeshiyahu 59, or Isaiah 59, and verse 14, and justice is driven back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and integrity is unable to enter. But you see, if you look at it, if you go back about 3,500 years ago, that was from this point, that was the time the covenant was given. So it looks like in many layers of time, from thir three and a half thousand years to three, uh, to three and a half years to 3.5 days, this reflection is, is mounting and refining itself. You know? But um, I might just be dreaming, but I'm not going to make a chart of it, but it, it is odd that Mount Sinai occurred about three and a half days ago. Mm. If you think of a day as a thousand years. Mm. Wow. Because if, if you look at it one dimensionally, 
then you're going to lose that. Because if, but if you look at it in a more dimensional viewpoint, um, it could be that these two men could also be reflected in the fact that the, uh, the witnesses themselves, being the covenant, have already been prophesying to the world, saying the Ten Commandments. You know about these? You know, uh, who hasn't heard of the Ten Commandments? You know, and they're teaching against them. And the government saying, no, you can't put these in here. What do you think this is? This is the government's property. No, this belongs to the people, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Did you say uh, a bit uh, a couple of minutes ago that when the, uh, the two witnesses are raised up, the spirit of life comes into them and they're raised up. If that's represented in, in, uh, in all the people and the tribes, when they're raised up, are you saying that's the first resurrection? That's amazing. Yeah, right. yeah, it would have to be. Yeah, the first resurrection. A lot of people don't know there's going to be two resurrections. Mm. Uh, of course, not counting Yahushua's resurrection, but the uh, fact that the first resurrection is going to be those people who have been well, the wise virgins the wise managers that have been all through time and uh, they're going to be, uh, you know, the first one. And then, of course, a thousand years later, at the end of the millennium, at the Great White Throne Judgment is the final resurrection where everyone is raised. And that would be a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, of course, people are teaching error, error on that, too, saying that they're all going to be thrown into the lake of fire. A great many will, but that's only if their names are not in the scroll of life. Yeah. But the ones that are in the Book of Remembrance will be in the first resurrection. That's Malachi too, because he talks about their, those people who meditate upon his name. And of course, thinking about his name and meditating on his name as Lord is not exactly what he's talking about. You know, that's not his name. You know. We know his name. We know our husband's name. His, his name is Yahushua. You know. And all Israel will be mourning for him when they see him coming as a firstborn. Uh, they'll say, oh, what have we done? You know, Zechariah 14, you know. You can look at the two witnesses in different ways. They're individuals, but they're also corporate. You know, the people of Israel. And then You've got Yehuda, you've got the lost tribes, as we understand them, northern Israel. Well, they're all lost. They're all scattered, I should say. They're, they're not lost to anything except to themselves. But they are scattered tribes, you know. And the uh, restoration, how can we... I mean, this is all about restoration. But... Uh, it's to the covenant, you know, the, to the to the marriage, and the Ten Commandments are that uh, that wedding. Now in Yahu or Jeremiah eleven verse six it says, "And Yahuwah said to me, Proclaim these words in the cities of Yehuda, and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and do them." Well, today we hear false teachers saying we don't even have to obey the Jewish Sabbath day, like it's Jewish. Well. It's, it, it isn't. It's, the, it's for all men to obey. And we, as Israel, are supposed to teach all nations everything he commanded us to obey. You know, not leaving anything out. And there's not going to be two bodies, like, those are Gentiles, and these are other people that obey the covenant. No, everybody has to obey. We're all one body. You know. There's to be one law for the foreigner and for the native-born. And the native born is brought near. Yeshia, or no, it's uh, Yeshia, or Isaiah, chapter 56, talks about that. So uh, we're hearing false gospels all the time. But the true message has always remained the same. Repent for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. Now, it's interesting, too, that there's about a billion people serving a deity called A-L-L-A-H. Now, that word comes from the Hebrew, and it is based on, upon the word Elohim, or El. It is true that that's uh, a fact. 
But, you know, the, Israel's witnesses, and we're on the topic of witnesses, Israel is to witness that Yahuwah is Elohim, not A-L-L-I-H is Elohim. That would be like saying, Elohim is Elohim. Okay. You know, or the Lord is Elohim. See, that's what most people read in their King James Version. They read that the Lord, He, is G-O-D. What? <laughs> you see how silly that sounds? Well, it isn't the Lord who is G-O-D. It's, it says, Yahuwah, He is Elohim. And in Isaiah, or, well, in Yeshiyahu 43, 9 through 12, all the nations shall be assembled, and all the peoples be gathered, who among them declares this, and show us former events. Let them give their witnesses to be declared right, or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, and my servant whom I chose, whom I have chosen, so that you know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no elf was formed, nor after me there is none. I, I am Yahuwah, and besides me there is no deliverer. I, I have declared and saved and made known, and there was no foreign mighty one among you. And you are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, that I am El. Let's read that again. And you are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, that I am Elohim. That I am Elohim is what he's saying. I am El. So we're his witnesses to the world, appealing and pleading with him, as if Yahusha is in us, pleading through us, saying, listen to us. Yahuwah is Elohim. He is Elohim. So, wow. And, and, and we're, we can't get emotional about it, but we are so zealous. That's what we're committed to do. Mm -hmm. But Yahuwah will raise the dead before his enemies, and then the slaughter begins. Yahuwah is Elohim, and we're his witnesses. This stands in contrast to the testimony that A-L-L-A-H is the one true G-O-D. Well, <laughs> it's like saying that G-O-D is G-O-D. And anyway, and there's some guy that's his messenger. They, they say, uh, some individual named, uh, well, they call him by his name, Muhammad. And, uh, you know, uh, very, very different sort of fellow. To, to look, but, I mean, there's only one messenger? You know, that's strange. See, the scripture doesn't say that there's only one messenger, you know, mm -hmm. except the messenger of Elohim is Yehudah himself. But um, a final contest between the two witnesses and the prophets of B-A-A-L and A-S-H-E-R-A-H is about to be held as in the days of Eliyahu. Remember in the days of Eliyahu there was a, a contest. Well, the, the contest is still going on now in the world because people are still saying, the Lord, he, that's who we worship? Because the translators have tricked them, see? Just like they trick, you know, the people in northern Israel to worship the false deities. So, uh, we know who we worship because we know his name. Because Yahushua himself said, uh, many will come in, in that day and say, Lord, or Adonai, Adonai, did we not, you know, do these wonderful things in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Because, you, know, you know, the relationship. See, that he has to know him means that you know him and that he knows you. There's a relationship, you know. But uh, billions of people are going to finally find out who Elohim really is. So, uh, some people have been, uh, I don't know if we want to go to the idea of Eliyahu being in a time portal or not, because... <laughs> well, that was good, that I don't do with that. Yeah, yeah, it is a possibility, of course. But, uh, you know, Yehukanen being alive is enough of a, you know, a, a, an amazing stretch of one's ima imagination. But uh, it does seem to indicate that that's what he was teaching us in the last chapter mm -hmm. of, the, of John. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the, the word went out among the Nazarene that, you know, he was never going to die. Yeah, go there. We, we just watched the um, fifth season of The Fringe, so go, go there. Love the time portals. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen that, but I, uh, but Phyllis and I like to watch Fringe. It's a fun thing. Mm. The characters are fun. The alternate reality, the alternate uh, yeah. dimensions. Yeah. Mm. Ah. So you reckon when Eliyahu flew up in the air with his chariot, he went into a, a stargate? Well, it would. He went into the sky, and he. We don't know what he was going for or to, but you know there is a, a, a one interesting chapter, and there's a fellow. It's in Second Chronicles, if I recall, and I don't remember the chapter, but there was a a king who reigned, and it says that a letter was received from Eliyahu. Uh, some period of time after he had gone up into the chariot of fire. So uh, he may have not, uh, you know, he might be in the same situation that you can in. I don't know. But uh, we see, these are all things that we can just guess and surmise about. But, uh, well, anything's possible. If Yahuwah lives outside of time and he can see all past, present, and future, why couldn't? Yeah. Why can't he transport somebody from the past to the future when he straight away? It's not like something he can't do. Because, you know, it's my theory that, and it is only my theory, and I'm not the only one that has it, but when he said, let there be light, that, that, organi that he organized the chaos into a time continuum. Because, see, when he created the heavens and the earth, it doesn't say he created time. But time came into being when... There, when light was created, you know, and then there was a past, a present, and a future, so that there was this rate of now. And I and I discussed that in a DVD that's or no, it's a CD right now. I've mailed it to you, but it's 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 on the subject of the Shekinah, and uh, it's when he created light. That it's my theory, for my study of cosmology and causality, that there would have been order established when he said that. Because uh, when he brings light into the world, it wouldn't just be the light that we see, but but the fact that he brings order, you know, and, and, and from the chaos. See, light is thought of in a broader sense as being an orderly thing, you know. That's what we understand it as, too. There's order. There's a... There's laws to this kingdom, you know. The kingdom is infinite, but it has boundaries of, of, of eternity. But uh, the earth, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in Shamayim. Because it's being done in Shamayim eternally. But it's not necessarily being done here. That's why we pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on this earth as it is in Shabbat. <laughs> so if you want to have his light and his presence in your home, yeah. get everything in order. Get your affairs in order. So yeah, take that. look at it from his point of view. Mm. Get rid of the chaos. The chaos. And all the horrible things that people do to one another. Mm. But... Uh, Let's see, there's two, and then let's see if we can find page three. There was a, probably some interesting things on page three. Do you have the... Uh, I'm just flying with you. I don't have anything in front of me today. I've got... Uh, no, I've got the old doco I made, which I'll chuck bits off behind you. But uh, I'm just flying. <laughs> All right, let's see if there's anything else that we can bring up. Well... Uh, Anyway, we mentioned earlier that the two witnesses are a legal established precedent for something that involves the death penalty. And we know that when the seven bowls start, it's the, it's the seventh trumpet that brings out the, 
manifestation of those seven bowls. And the seven bowls are going to be dealing death, like one after the other, plagues upon plagues upon plagues, serious things. And before that happens, the two witnesses appear. So they're required for the pronouncement of any death penalty. And they will be the first to enact the death. And it's, uh, it's true that for literally thousands of years that mankind has been worshiping falsely and they've been living without Yahuwah's Torah. Therefore, they haven't had a relationship with him. And for this, the earth is going to be judged. And all those whose names are not found in the scroll of life will be expunged from existence forever in an eternal death. Because the penalty for not obeying the Torah and not accepting the blood of Yahushua is death. And a minimum of two witnesses is required as prescribed in the Torah Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, and Matthew, verse 26, I mean, chapter 26, verse 60. Now, a witness, what is a witness? Well, in the Hebrew, it's ed, ed. It's a witness, and it's a testimony, or it's a legal de declaration. It's when two witnesses make a statement and that they declare something, and then people have to respond to it. And when we've received Yahushua, who's the mediator of the covenant to live within us, our hearts and minds are sealed for the day of redemption. And we're no longer under the penalty of death. But we walk in a newness of life with a new mind and the spirit, which embodies the living Torah, or the living word, the, the instructions, the Torah. And again, we see that this is the principle that Yahushua, the, the disciple whom Yahushua loved, teaches us about a witness. In Revelation 19, it says in verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See, do not do it. I am your fellow servant. This is a messenger, uh, an angel, you know. And of your brothers who possess the witness of Yahushua, Worship Elohim, for the witness of Yahushua is the spirit of prophecy. So it's a spirit, you know, and Yahushua being in us can prophesy, you know, and it doesn't matter who we are, you know. He uses the, 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 the meek and, and the lowly to do his work, you know. I mean, the powerless. In Matthew 7, verse 16, it says, By your fruits, by their fruits, you shall know them. You can identify them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And then he explained that many would be told to depart from him because they were led by savage wolves and lived without his Torah. In other words, they were lawless. A message for the latter days was prepared for us in the 8th century BCE, at Isaiah 30, verses 8 through 11. And go write it before them on a tablet, and inscribe it on a scroll, that it is for a latter day, a witness forever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who refuse to hear the Torah of Yahuwah, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right, Speak to us what is smooth. Prophesy deceits. Turn aside from the way. Swerve from the path. Cause the set-apart one of Israel to cease from before us. And if you go into any steeple, you'll see it. They teach what is smooth rather than the Torah of Yahuwah. When was the last time you went into a witch hat, which is the huge steeple? Because <laughs> see, the roof and the steeple are kind of like a big witch hat. Mm. If you ever, have you ever gone in there and heard the Torah of Yahuwah? No. No. Well, that, that's sad. Because you see, that's where the priests, are, the, the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge. Mm -hmm. They teach their flocks to turn aside from the way and swerve from the path. But who does Yahuwah tell us are his two witnesses? And when we're to watch for them? Here's a clue. 
Acts 1, verse 7 and 8. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the set-apart Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Yehuda and in Shomeron and to the ends of the earth. While the two witnesses perform their duties in the city of peace, there will be many more witnesses across the earth having received power. And these are the branches, or the not serene, or the two houses. The, the Samaritans are the lost, or the northern ten tribes, or Shomeron, and, and also Yehuda. So you've got the, the northern tribes and the southern tribes dispersed into the whole world, and those are two witnesses too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would say that all we have to do is basically look for those that have the ability given to them and the mission given to them to proclaim it, you know, the Torah of Yahuwah. And they're obviously the branches of, of Yahushua because, see, if we're abiding in, his, in the life of the root, him being the root, then we naturally will bring up the, the lifeblood of that of that root into our branches and the fruit will be visible to all in the world because uh, in, in John or well in Eleazar <laughs> or in Yehudah in chapter 15 verses 5 through 8 it says Yehusha speaking I am the vine you are the branches he who stays in me and I in him he bears much fruit because without me you are able to do nothing if anyone does not stay in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you stay in me and my words in you, you shall ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. In this my Father is esteemed that you bear much fruit, and you shall be my top ones. Now, the, the idea that we're called Nazarene, branches, guardians, Torah teachers, we're, we're described in Acts 24, verse 5, and it's a Hebrew word, and it means watchmen or branches, as in the descendants of the teachings. You know, like a branch branches off, and, but it, the blood of the, the life of the plant goes up through all those branches, and then it bears fruit. Mm -hmm. And the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But you see, those things are, they're all there. They're not just one or two there. They're all there. And uh, the first one is love. <laughs> because the goal is love. You know, That's what the Torah teaches us. See, the, the, the commandments teach us how to love Yahuwah and how to love our neighbor. And our neighbor is everyone. So I don't know why people resist it. Yeah. So we talked about the secret ending, the secret of Elohim. But this is before the seventh trump. You know, the seventh trump is is the beginning of the bowls, and we can feel it. I mean, you know, the world is in great turmoil right now. People are running around with nuclear weapons. The the, the very worst people in the that. It, the very last people that you would want to have nuclear weapons, they have them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we have all these droughts and floods, and, and of course the people are saying, it's us doing it. Well, <laughs> see, that's one of the tricks, too, because when they say it's, it's climate change, they're, they're not acknowledging that these things are plagues. You know, oh, the earth just shook under the earth, ocean and a half a million people got washed away. Oh, it's us. It's us. <laughs> Our fossil fuels. Climate change. Uh, see, that's all part of the, you know, the, the lie, you know. Mm -hmm. Keep the worldly person de in denial, you know. Mm -hmm. 
So a witness is not something that we do. A witness is something that we are all the time. Oh, of course. You don't just rock up to your mate's house and go, okay, you ready? Let's go witnessing. It's something you are all the time. It's something you are, yeah. And we're witnesses that Yahuwah is Elohim, mm. primarily, because uh, the world is not aware of his name, nor, uh, I mean, a lot of the Nazarim are arguing with each other about how to pronounce it, how to spell it, <laughs> which is, I mean, wow, come on. <laughs> uh, if you have to use a W, then use a W. Yeah, but let's just get over ourselves and yeah. and be real. But uh, the world is watching us tearing one another apart mm. and going, "Whoa, I don't know if I want to be like them." But the uh, you know we need to love one another. You know, and get over ourselves and put ourselves as secondary to the other. Even if we don't believe the other person has it together, can we be humble? You know. And just say, okay, all right, you know. And who are we supposed to go after? Mm. We're not supposed to attack one another. We're not. We, we're meaner to one another than we are uh, to the outsiders. Of course, why would we be mean to outsiders? Because it, it seems like the only people that accuse one another so violently are those that believe in a close way. They're, they they believe nearly the same things. So they get really upset with each other. I mean, mm -hmm. When we should be back to back, shoulder to shoulder, going out and witnessing to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the Ten Commandments. How do you like that? You know? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, the first commandment says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Have no other before my face. Well, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know why. I just did. Well, I know why because he, we, because we meditate on it. When we meditate on his commandments, you know, it's like Psalm one says. You know, it, it, we're like tr a tree that grows by rivers of waters. Its its fruit never withers. It's it's sitting there. The fruit wouldn't wither because you're always meditating on his commandments, and it's producing fruit. You know, the fruit that the that love produced. You know, mm. but. Uh, you know, to to put uh, other names in there to translate it differently and say, well, let's not even translate it. Let's just maul it. You know, turn it into a complete disarray. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what they did. And uh, you know, they even they can't even get the order right. If you go to Exodus twenty or Deuteronomy five, and you just read it. The list is right there. It's the Catholics have a different order than the Protestants. And why would that be? Well, there's a reason. You know, it's because they wanted their idols. You know, their statues. Yeah. And, uh, they wanted to raise money and like they put the coins in the little candle box and kneel down in front of a statue, and then they run around like it's some kind of a big coke machine and say, "Well, it's time to empty the coke machine. Let's get the let's reload the candles and." Get that money, well, whatever. But it's it's really serious idolatry to kneel down in front of an object. Hmm. You know, when we were told specifically not to do that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> See, we can't get it together. You know, we can't even get the the covenant itself together. You know, hmm. but uh, that's why I read it every time we have a seminar. At the very beginning of the seminar, I read the Ten Commandments as they're given. In direct translation with correct name, so that there can be no mistake. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and it helps, you know, a lot of people, because it's the foundation, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you're on a shaky foundation, it's not good. Well, mm -hmm. brother, we've been doing this for an hour and a half. That's amazing, <laughs> brother. Yeah, totally amazing. I think. Um, I think the Nazarim, uh, so far up until now, have, have made, and I mean, they're always being educated, but I think they've made a, a mockery out of Yahushua's Yahushua's true message. I mean, they're going out there with all these weird-looking 
hats and garments and you know zit zits dragging along the ground and you know they're just they're making an eyesore out to the world because I mean they're not realizing that the world is full of strongholds. You can't just go up to somebody and you know I believe in Yahusha and attend you know like it's they're just going to go who on earth are you like who's this weirdo? It's kind of like you got to play it really cunning. You got to sort of look similar and behave similar and make friendships with people and you know like that article Chris wrote a couple of weeks ago you got, you got to kind of hook them like you're fishing you kind of got to hook them and a fish if, you, if you're not offering something that looks like bait they're not going to come anywhere near you it's um you know people are walking around with all these opinions and like they're in some kind of religious movement and wondering why they're not getting you know getting any fish or hunting any game and not getting any results because they're not playing it right you gotta look nice and speak nice and smell nice and and like just behave like normal we're in the 21st century <laughs> you know it's the ancient path hasn't changed but i mean i don't think yahusha if he came onto the earth say this year to die for us i don't think he would come wearing robes he would he would be he would come to the earth the way, you know, the, the way we look now, wouldn't he? To to be as effective as he could. Well, yeah. See, he wasn't indoctrinating anybody to say well, you've got to wear this kind of clothing. That's yeah. uh, that's some people do teach that. They say no, that's the way it was, and that's where you're supposed to do it. These are all examples for us. Well, it isn't. Those are external things. Those are what what we would call superficiality. You know. Mm. Uh, what was a type of um, civil uh, dress mm. for particular people, you know, doesn't really have any bearing on it. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. He would be wearing uh, pants and shirt. Mm. I don't know if he'd be wearing a tie. He probably wouldn't be doing anything pretensive or, mm. you know, in pretense. But he would be doing everything in a very humble way. And he would blend in perfectly with everyone. But what he was doing and saying would be absolutely stunning and profound. Yeah. And of course, it would also catch the, um, the the attention and the hatred of the people who want to keep their little circus going. Because see, he'd be the biggest. He would be putting their circus out of business. You know. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Mm. Yeah, they've got their own little. Uh, you know, three ring circus going on, and 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 anything that competes with that, and governments are the same way. I mean, governments don't like to have competition either, because the ultimate goal of a government is to pres is to preserve itself. Uh, it, it's more important to itself than the population. Any population that it happens to be over that supports it is less important than it supporting itself and retaining its presence. So it, it ultimately gets into a point where it wants to get worshipped. Mm -hmm. And competing, anything that competes with attention, uh, it doesn't want it on its turf. It wants it off. It pushes it out of its, out of its environment. And then it, uh, if it had its own way, it would push it completely out of its borders. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, the, the dragon is behind all that because principalities and powers are behind all the political leaders of the world. And they've all been aggregating together, building slowly towards a one world system so that they can ultimately cleanse the world and rebuild it the way they want it. And of course, the way the dragon was, you know. You know, reduce the population, stop using up the resources like we have, and uh, kill off all these people and create a completely new language. They'd like to do that. They want to overcome the Babel effect, but they're never going to do that. Mm -hmm. But they have a dream of it. If you read the Georgia Guidestones, have you ever seen those? Yeah. yeah, there's, if you Google Georgia Guidestones, you'll see, or Guidestones, you know, you'll see the uh, 10 new rules of the earth. Wow. Yeah. And one of them is to establish one religion. And it is itself humanism, and of course, uh, one world religion. You know, yeah. 
It's really, really creepy. Uh, and it stands as an abomination. It's in this country, by the way, uh, which doesn't surprise me because I, I have a, a feeling that the throne of Hashatan is in this country. And it's, you know, so it's emanating from Washington, D.C. Just like the Arabs believe it is. The Islamic people. They're right about that. This is the great Satan. You know? <laughs> but they don't know that they're part of the whole operation, too, because this whole thing is about to, about to topple, you know? It's at a tipping point, you know? So people, yeah, think, like, people think it's Rome, but Rome is controlling the, the UN well, anyway, isn't it? Well, Rome is the fourth beast, and it is going to go on until Yahushua returns. Because he's going to return, and he's represented metaphorically by the rock that strikes the statue in the toes, and it shatters the entire thing, and then the wind blows it away, and it can't be found. Because, but the rock, the kingdom of Yahushua, will grow and fill the earth. But uh, the one world government thinks that it can overcome all these things, and it doesn't even buy that. It doesn't believe the prophecies. Although I think that the dragon does, but somehow, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the dragon is insane, you know, insane, you know, yeah. utterly bonkers. And uh, he's going to be uh, thrown into the lake of fire at the end of the thousand years. Yeah. But the beast and the false prophet are going to go in at the beginning of the millennium, you know. And then I guess what Yahushua is going to do is bind the adversary and let him just so, sort of sit there and think about it for a thousand years, <laughs> you know, which is going to be a very painful thing for him. You know? hmm. But it, it must be a tormented mind, you know, to be so incredibly intelligent and yet so insane. You know, yeah, must be torture. Uh, anyway, dragging as many people with him is the objective. So, we're, all we have to do is overcome, and the and the way we overcome is by inviting Yahusha into our hearts and lives and minds, and and to teach our children his covenant as he told us, and speak of them when we rise up and when we lie down, and when we sit in our home, and if we if we do those things, we're going to be winding up being different people because we'll be studying his word and meditating in his word day and night. Psalm 1 is just amazing. After I meet Yahushua, I want to go hunt down two more people. One of them is Dawood, or the writer of the Psalms, this, the great musician, the king of Israel. And I also want to meet Yeshiyahu because he was the first one I read that Yahushua used. You know, when we think about the person through whom we came to the truth, it, I know it's Yahushua. He's, he's the one that draws us through people. But I was reading Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah, chapter 53, when, I, when Yahushua reached out and grabbed me. You know. And I do want to meet that man, because he was the vessel. You know. So we do feel that, uh, a very strong bond to someone. Some of us are uh, affected by living people because Yahushua in them has reached forth and grabbed them. But in my case, it was a dead guy. <laughs> it was through his words. You know. yeah. Yeah. Of course, many people. I mean, all the disciples of Yahushua are responsible too because, you know, can you imagine meeting all those fellows? And and and, the, and Miriam and Martha and uh, just all these wonderful people, precious people, that were extremely sinful, you know. And yet, yeah. who should change them? You know, yeah. if he can do that, they're just regular people, you know. But he indwelled them and used them, you know. Mm -hmm. So amazing. Well, that's amazing, brother. Mm. Yeah, you do show some things. Wonderful. Well, we talked about Eliyahu in the three and a half year drought. And yes. How that's yes. Related, you know, 
but uh, we'll see how that all works out. Yes. So yes. you want to leave it at this and see how that works? Beautiful, Mike. Very happy with all that. Yeah, it's great. What's the, what's the next study you think we should go for? Well, I don't know if we should have done it before this one uh, chronologically, but the second exodus, we have to cover that too. Oh, that's all related. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all wrapped up in this, the two witnesses, and the uh, the other thing that we had. Well, every pretty much all the things that we've done. The second exodus is like mm -hmm. his final great deliverance of his people. You know, all the prophecies that led up to it and why they're sealed and all that. So the second exodus, you want to do that maybe in a week or two? Or? Yeah, next week's yeah. fine with me. Next week? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Love you, brother. Oh, I love you, and I'll talk to you when we see each other next week. Yeah. Well, Bye, everybody. See you later, man. See you later. See you later. Love you. Bye-bye. Witnesses, yeah. Witnesses. Yeah, Elohim. Witnesses, yeah. Witnesses, not Allah or the Lord. Witnesses, yeah. Right.